We were driving back from my grandparents' 25th wedding anniversary. We being my mom and myself. I was nine at the time. My dad was at home sick with a bad case of food poisoning from the takeout that we had had the night before. Mom had debated not going to the anniversary celebration, but he had insisted that we go, as it was her parents. And when we had left, he had been lying down in front of the TV, trash can at the ready. Mom was a bit nervous about the whole thing, and because Dad had always driven before. It wasn't that she was a bad driver, but she hated driving anywhere more than a half hour away, and the venue was an hour north of us. She was fine if she had directions to follow, but constantly second-guessed herself and could be a bit nerve-wracking to travel with. We had left at 5 and we were supposed to be home by 10. We had made it to the place fine, although it was starting to get dark when we had arrived. And by the time that we had finally left, after saying our goodbyes to everyone, it was pitch black and drizzling. Because we were far out in the countryside, there were a severe lack of main roads and far, far too many winding ones, spreading through the hills and trees like so many snakes. We had only been driving for about 15 minutes when I heard Mom swear and looked up from the pale light of my Game Boy. She glanced back at me with a forced smile. Oh, just made a wrong turn somewhere. I'll turn us around. We drove farther slower down the same road, which was lined with orchards and farms, and finally found a rocky drive to turn around in. But ten minutes later, we seemed no less lost, and young as I was, I could sense her growing unease. It was just so dark and it was starting to work itself up into a storm outside, and we weren't anywhere familiar or even near any place to pull in and ask for directions. Eventually my mom pulled over on the side of the road to call my aunt, but the call kept getting dropped, and we found ourselves on the road again. I think we went past this when we were headed there, my mom finally said, sounding a bit hopeful and turned us down another road. This one took us away from the farms and orchards and into a more wooded area but the road was far less bumpy, and at least now there were mile marker signs. I squinted out of the window, an anxious kid to begin with. Her nerves just fed mine. But at least we seem to be actually going somewhere now, as opposed to driving in circles. And then someone ran out in the middle of the road. Mom shrieked and slammed on the brakes, narrowly avoiding hitting them, while I tried to remember how to breathe in the back seat. In the washed out headlights stood a girl, maybe a woman. She was screaming and crying, pounding in the car for us to let her in. Mom rolled down the window a little. Please. And the girl whimpered. Please, can you just give me a lift? It's my boyfriend. I had to run away. Please, I can't let him find me. It was hard to make out her face but she sounded anywhere from her late teens to her early twenties. To her credit, my mom was wary. Let me call the police. Please, just let me in. You don't have to drive anywhere. Her voice cracked in terror as she sniffled, hair plastered to her face from the rain and the wind. Mom hesitated and then leaned over and unlocked the passenger side door. The girl darted around the front of the car and scrambled in, closing the door behind you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then she pulled out a gun. Actually, I didn't even realize it was a gun at first. The car light was on, but it wasn't very bright. And I'd never seen a gun in person before. So for a few seconds, I was confused as to why my mom had suddenly frozen. Cell phone still in hand. I might not have ever seen a gun in real life before. But I was old enough to know what one could do. Give me the phone, the girl said. All the terror was gone, but just as breathlessly as ever. She sounded almost excited, as if she was about to go on a ride at an amusement park. And then she repeated herself. Give me the phone, lady. It wasn't said out of anger. She said it like she was reciting a line in a play that she starred in, 
and had been practicing her award-winning line for ages. Mom gave her the phone, and the girl pocketed it. I watched, mute with the sort of fear that rendered everything static. I couldn't have moved even if I wanted to. I didn't even think that would work. The girl laughed. Shit, Max was right. People are freaking morons. I had the sudden thought that I did not want to meet Max. I was right. I studied the girl for a moment. She really was very young. My nine-year-old mind identified her as more of a bigger and better kid than an actual adult. She didn't even talk like an adult. She talked the way that middle schoolers did on the bus. Her hair was bleached blonde and scraped back in a thin ponytail, and she had a pretty heart-shaped face. But her eyes freaked me out. They were dark, not just in color, but in a way that I can't quite explain. You just got the feeling that looking at her, that this was it. There was nothing hiding behind those eyes. Rather, the look in her eyes is what should have been hidden, but it was right there. Stark naked and grotesque, forcing you to face it head on. There was nothing there when there should have been something. No light, not even a glint of it. A total void of emotion beyond her shallow glee, as if she had just won a petty prize. I looked to my mom. To my surprise, she was not crying. She actually looked calmer than she had before, even when we were driving around and around. Her face was completely blank, something I was not used to seeing on her. Generally, in contrast with my dad, mom was an open book. She wore her emotions on her sleeve and came across as somewhat fragile, vulnerable. But now there was nothing there, nothing to fracture. Her slender face mirrored the girl with the guns, oddly enough. I recognized it even then. Like the girl, there wasn't anything there. But that was because some sort of wall had been constructed, or a door slammed shut, or one of those gates they pulled down over shop fronts at the mall installed. Mom had shut down in a way that made it impossible to tell what she was thinking or how she was feeling. When she spoke, her voice was flat and calm. Let us out of the car, and you can take it wherever you need to go. It was not a question or a plea. It was an ironclad suggestion a teacher gives a misbehaving student on their last warning. The suggestion you hear from a parent when they are not in the mood. It bordered on an order. Looking back on it now, I think the girl was hoping my mom would break down and beg. Because she looked pissed. Like she had been robbed of a show she'd been promised she'd get to see. You're not going anywhere. She said almost defensively. Like she had to justify it somehow. In a way, I was kind of relieved at the time. To a nine-year-old, the cold and the rain and the dark and the wind-lashed trees outside were just as terrifying as the gun. Someone rapped on the window across from me and I jumped, flinching back into my seat, the seatbelt biting into my shoulder. The girl leaned back, the gun still trained on my mom, unlocked that door and greeted them as they clambered in. Hey, baby. I understood that this was Max. It couldn't have been any clearer had he worn a shirt with it embroidered across the front. It was easy to see why they were together. He was not right, just not in the same way that she was. Something about him was not what it should have been. I wasn't scared of him in a way that a kid should be of a strange man who could hurt them. I was scared of him in the way anyone, child or adult, is of a lone wolf that saunters up to their side, jaw snapping. If the girl had nothing, he had something. It just wasn't what he should have had. Max had hooded eyes, almost like a dog or some other animal, where it seems like they're staring through their own eyelids at you. I don't remember what color they were. His hair was brown and long, and for a man's, it brushed his shoulders. It vaguely reminded me of a picture of someone, either Jesus or some famous musician. He was lanky. He had to hunch a little in the backseat next to me, 
and almost made him seem crooked. He was baby-faced and clean-shaven, but it didn't make him any less intimidating. He reclined back in the seat as if he had just entered a limo, and then his head lolled slightly. I watched his hands. They were big. They reminded me of my dad's in that sense, and they were playing with a neat little knife flipping it over and over, almost frantically, in contrast with his laid-back demeanor, as if they had developed a mind of their own, or if his mind was simply located in his wrists. It's a nice car, he said conversationally. Your husband make a lot of money, dear. My mom was silent. The introduction of a second threat must have been like a punch to the gut. The girl, she might have felt she could maintain equal footing with, and maybe somehow get her out of the car. Max, it was clear that he was the one in charge now, and a lot less predictable. I'm Maxwell. He introduced himself, and he held out his hand for me. I shied away from it, and then I thought that I might set him off, and I brushed my fingers against it briefly. That's Ronnie. We needed a car. It's a long story. I won't bore you guys. You should have seen her face when I pulled out the gun. Ronnie steered from the front seat, jabbing it in my mom's direction. She didn't flinch. Holy shit, it was priceless. Don't curse in front of the kid. Max cautioned. He looked to me. You have a name? I glanced at mom. She nodded minutely. Cam. I said simply. Cam. He stretched it out past its one syllable. Like a piece of gum. That's nice. What about you, honey? He peered at my mom. Who turned slightly sideways in her seat. But not quite facing him. More focused on Ronnie and her gun. Angela, she said after a pause. I blinked. I wasn't used to hearing her just say her first name like that. And then I thought later that maybe she hadn't wanted them to know her last name. Like an angel, he grinned. And just you and little Cam tonight. Where is Mr. Angel? Expecting us home by ten. Mom said neutrally. He's going to be worried if we're late. I didn't understand it then, but it was a way of saying, if we're to disappear, someone wouldn't wait too long to call the cops. Shame, said Max. It was his way of saying, if I gave a shit about the cops, I wouldn't be sitting in the back of your car with a knife. Max, come on. Ronnie snapped from up front. And she sounded impatient. We're wasting time just sitting here. He shrugged, as if not terribly concerned about the passing of time in general. Fine, get in the back. I'll go up front. Are you kidding me? I have the gun. I trust Angela. Besides, I want to get a better look at her. Ronnie swore under her breath and got out of the front getting into the back while Max climbed into the passenger seat, carefully arranging his long limbs. He said something to Mom in a low tone, and she stiffened slightly. In the back seat, Ronnie directed her gun at the nearest target. Me. If you so much as make a freaking sound, I will shoot you. She told me rather chipperly. Again, Max muttered in the front. I stared at her. I would have been stupid not to be scared, but despite of her gun and her furiously cheerful voice, it felt like I was dealing with something out of a movie or a game. A make-believe monster. I didn't really believe that she could hurt me. In a way, it was weird. Either way, my lack of much of a reaction didn't make her any happier. She edged up next to me, the gun uncomfortably close to my midsection. Come on, drive, she demanded. We drove for a few minutes, Max giving calm, pleasant instructions to my mom on where to go. We found ourselves on yet another lonely road, this one overgrown and completely deserted. 
I listened for cars, for any sounds at all, but I heard nothing but the rain. And then the car stopped. Ronnie kicked open my door and shoved me out, her fingers digging painfully into the back of my neck. The wind had died down some outside, but I shivered in the cold downpour, wishing that I could put my hood up. Likewise, my mom stood beside me. Max kept his hand on the back of her neck. I suddenly wanted to break it. You can just leave us here. Take the car and go. Mom said in the same flat, calm tone as before. You'll be miles gone by the time we find anyone. Do you think we're retards? Ronnie snorted. You think we're... She quieted when Max gave her a single glance. We're going to take a walk, was all he said. Don't worry. In the dark, Mom's hand found mine. She gave it a single squeeze. I understood then that they were not going to let us go. That we were not getting back in the car. That we were not going home. You might not believe me. I was nine. What did I know? I should have been oblivious. But I knew. The people who have the luxury of not seeing death coming at all are few and far between. We walked, or more like slide, across the wet, muddy ground, through bushes under trees. We didn't walk long. It was very hard to make out Ronnie and Max in the dark. They were more voices, shifting forms than anything else. They didn't seem quite real. Who first? Ronnie asked eagerly, when we at last came to a halt. Be quiet. Max said and then to me, close your eyes and turn around. Mom said something to him in a low, forceful voice. He stared at her. Angel, you're not serious. She just looked at him. He let out a quiet laugh. Okay, Ronnie, take the kid back to the road. Mom mouthed something at me. I had no idea what it was. As I trudged back towards the road with Ronnie, glancing back frantically every few moments to look back at her and Max. And then it occurred to me. Run. She had a gun, but it was so dark it was impossible to see more than a foot or two in front of your face. And add rain to that, and all of the trees, and the slick wet ground. You want to know what he's doing to your mom? Ronnie asked me, her breath hot in my ear. You know where babies come from? I waited until she straightened up to laugh, and then I ran, not straight ahead but back in the general direction of where we had come from. I heard her muffled yell and then a shot rang out. It didn't matter because it didn't hit me. I kept running, legs training up black mud, rain pelting me in the face. I ran so fast that I tripped right over Max. He was lying face down on the ground, the mud mixing with his long hair. Something was stuck in his neck. I realized that it was his knife. Mom was sitting on the ground beside him. Her hair a haggard mess and her makeup streaming down her face. Her hands shaking in her lap. She looked up at me and saw me and pulled me to her, my head against her chest. And then she struggled up to her feet and we kept walking, listening for Ronnie all the while. Finally we heard a faint howl of rage in the distance, and at that point we stopped under a tree. And Mom with some effort lifted me up into one of the lower branches, and then clambered up herself. And we sat there for a long while, and then finally climbed down and kept walking. Twenty minutes later we stumbled upon a hunting lodge. A half hour later and the state police force seemed to show up. They had found Ronnie in the car just where it had been left. She had been kind enough in the end not to shoot herself inside of it. <laughs>